such a great burden to see, a great blessing to see young people. Thank you. It's such a blessing to see young people give service to God. Amen. Uh, thank you, young people, for your service. It's a wonderful thing to be in the house of the Lord on His holy Sabbath day. Amen. The scripture reading that we read, Psalm 77, verses 1 to 13, you see where David had a burden on his heart. He was wondering if God's mercies would be cast off forever. He was troubled in his thoughts and in verse 13 his thoughts are culminated with the words that we O God is in the sanctuary who is such a great God as our God so the psalm started off with David contemplating the various obstacles and trials but he was forced to conclude that God's ways are in the sanctuary but he had to exclaim how great is our God so there is something about the sanctuary that allowed David to see the greatness of God. You know, another psalm, another division of the psalm where one is seen contemplating trials and obstacles is Psalm 73. May we all turn to Psalm 73? And brothers and sisters, I invite you to all have your Bibles. Amen? Amen. You would find that I'm the kind of person when, when I share the word of God, I lose, use a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of scripture texts. Because I believe in the old Adventist way of Amen. using line upon line and precept upon precept to establish the truth. Amen. The word of God must have more than one witness. Amen. And God designed it that way so that, you know, God said in, in Isaiah, who shall be drawn from the breast and who shall be weaned from the, from, from, from the milk? And he gave the answer. Those who actually use line upon line and precept upon precept. So there's a time when you ought to be breastfed. Amen? Amen? Because when we come to God, we are babes. But as we grow up in the natural world, do we continue drinking from the breast? No. If you should see a 40-year-old man asking his mother at 60-something for breast milk, you would think that something is very wrong with that man. Amen? Amen. And it is so it is in the natural, so it should be in the spiritual. After a while, we should be weaned from the breast. In Psalm 77, 73, sorry, it says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He said that I almost lost my way. Because I was focusing on the prosperity of the wicked. Amen. Sometimes don't we get a bit discouraged when we see people just prospering in wickedness. Amen. People selling drugs and they have several cars and you are trying to do things the right way. And you can't even afford a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. You probably don't even have a good bicycle. Amen. But the wicked you see them prospering. So he suffered that same problem. He said for there are no bonds in their death but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covered them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than could wish. Or could wish, sorry. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens. And their tongue walketh through the earth. So, well, as we read on, we we'll realize that Esau... Asaph was troubled by the prosperity of the wicked. He said that, 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 that he couldn't understand it and he was made uncomfortable by it. But I want to focus on verse 17. He said that he had these plaguing troublesome thoughts until a point. It says in verse 17 that until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou casted them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. No, no, Esau got a correction from God. But how God corrected him was taking him into the sanctuary. And he said, then I could consider the end of the wicked. 
And he realized that the end of the wicked is that nice thing. You know, today on your personal, personal ministry's day, may I submit to you that in these times of challenges and when we see lots of scammers and all those people prospering and, and it seems that there is no, no, no reason to give this gospel. Because it seems that wickedness is increasing on every hand. That we need to take a walk into the sanctuary. Because it appears that the wicked are prospering. But God wants our people to continue to work for him. Amen. Even though it seems Amen. like it doesn't really pay off in the long run. Because brothers and sisters, it will. Amen. God's word never comes back to him. Boy. Amen. And God says that if you give up things for him in this life, in this life and the life to come, you will receive tenfold. Amen. And God is not a liar. Amen. Whatever he says, he will accomplish it. Amen. I've proven that for myself. So this morning we are going to take a walk into the sanctuary. Amen. But before I, I step on holy ground, let me remove my shoes. Let us pray. A righteous Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful word. Your living word. Your word that is alive. Your word that constantly changes. Your word that has sevenfold meanings with one verse. We ask Lord that you will teach us your ways. That you will teach us something about the plan of salvation by going into your sanctuary this morning. Lord, guide your word, we pray, and guide my thoughts. And guide the congregation as they receive of your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, do you know that the entire Bible is really written in the pattern of the sanctuary? Even accounts in the Bible that you probably would not think is speaking of the sanctuary service is actually speaking of the sanctuary service. For example, you have the children of Israel. And on the Passover night when they were supposed to be delivered out of Egypt, something had to be slaughtered for them to get blood over their doorposts so that they could be protected before they left. What was that creature? A lamb, right? Then after God delivered them on that fateful night, the, the Passover lamb's blood protected them from death and the destroying angel passed over them. What, what was the next great event? They, they, they had to pass through something before they, 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 they got to, 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 to the promised land. They had to pass through the Red Sea. And what is the Red Sea really? A big body of what? Water. Then after passing through this great body of water, they went into the wilderness of sin where, where they wandered for 40 how much? Years. Now after they wandered for 40 years, they had, they, 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 was there a point where, 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 where they actually came to, to, to this point where they had to come into oneness with God? Amen. Where they had to confess their sins, right? And when you are confessing your sins and coming into oneness with God, how do you access that? There's a mechanism that we all can do to access forgiveness through God. And what is that? Prayer. Prayer. And then when they, when they acknowledge their own sins and so on, did God give them something special? God gave them something that was written by the finger of God itself. What, what was that thing? The Ten Commandments. Now tell me something, brothers and sisters. Don't you see a pattern? In John 1, 29, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. After John presented him as the Lamb of God that taketh the sins of, taketh away the sins of the world, what happened to Jesus afterwards? He was, he was what? Baptized into what? water now after he was baptized into water don't you see jesus going into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days yes. now do you know that ezekiel 4 verse 6 says that a day is like a year yes. in prophetic matters yes. so israel god's firstborn you know god referred to israel as his firstborn was tempted in the wilderness of sin for 40 years but his actual firstborn only begotten son was tested for 40 days no, 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 did Jesus, after, uh, after overcoming the temptation for 40 days, did he overcome it through, through prayer? Yes. Was he strengthened through prayer? Yes. And, 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 and was the commandments of God taught by Jesus? You know that in Matthew chapter 5, he was actually teaching the commandments of God. He was giving them the commandments of God. But he was giving them the law in his true spirit. The Bible said that he went up into a mountain and gathered the people around him. The first time that the law was given was the people gathered to the foot of a mountain and did, did God reside up in the mountain while he was giving them the fire law? 
So Jesus lived the sanctuary pattern. And before today, you will realize that we are called to live the sanctuary pattern. Amen. We have to live the sanctuary pattern. But there's one article in the sanctuary this morning that I want to focus on because it's personal ministry's day. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 27. And brothers and sisters, I'll be using a lot of text. But I ask you, brothers and sisters, let us focus. Amen? Amen. Because we are, we are at an age where persons don't really know the Bible anymore. You know, at one point, some of the Adventists were known as people of the world. Then, after a while, we became known as people who can sing real well. No, I'm kind of worried to find out what we are known for. But brothers, we need to go, and sisters, we need to go back to being people of the word. Amen? Amen. Exodus 27 and verse 26, it says, Thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring the pure oil, olive bean, for the light to cause the lamp to burn whole on. Always. This lamp was always burn. Amen? Now, what is this lamp speaking to? Exodus 27, verse 26. Acts. I said Acts. I'm so sorry. Exodus. Exodus 27 and verse 26. My apologies. Exodus 27. Exodus 27 does not have verse 26? No. Oh, 20. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I'm glad you are following the Bible. It says here in Exodus 27 and verse 20, it says, And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil, olive bean for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. So the lamp was always burn. Amen. Now what is this lamp speaking to? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew the 5th chapter. I'm beginning at verse 14. And we are all together right now. Amen. Part before the mix up earlier. Matthew chapter 5. And beginning at verse 14. Matthew the 5th chapter and verse 14 says, Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick it giveth light unto all that are in the house. So the lampstand is, a, is an object that gave light in the sanctuary. Amen. And now Jesus is saying, the people of God, God's children are the light of the entire world. And he says, men don't light a candle and hide it under a bushel. But the candle's purpose is to give light to all that are in the house. Do you know that we are supposed to give light to each other? Yes. All of us are to impart light one to the other. Yes. Because a while ago, I, 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 because of my, my sight that I need to check out, I wasn't seeing properly the verse, and I was, but you were able to help me. So we are all supposed to give light to the house. Amen. So God says that we are all the light of the world. We are to be a light. We and men don't hide their light under a bushel, but they provide light for all that are in the house. Now you realize that those instruments use a particular thing to, 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 to give light. A lampstand or a candlestick. What 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 was it like a, a fluorescent bulb? No, what did it use to project light? Oil and something else. Fire. Fire. You know that fire is something very significant in the scriptures, brothers and sisters. You know that fire is a symbol of something very important or someone very important. Let's turn to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Hebrews chapter 12. And let us see why this fire was incorporated into the sanctuary and its services. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and looking at verse 29, it says, For what? Hebrews 12 and verse 29. Our oh, God is a what? Consuming what? Fire. So God is represented by what? Fire. Now, look again in Daniel 7 and verse 10. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 10. And I promise you, brothers and sisters, this is going somewhere. Daniel 7 chapter and verse 10. 
Daniel 7 chapter and verse 10 says, A, a fire stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. So you see, God is there in heaven. But the Bible says that a fiery stream issued from God. So God is a consuming fire, but a fiery stream issued forth from God. Can you imagine that picture? A fiery stream. Like a, 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 a lake of fire just running out from God. Now, God is a being of fire. Can we turn to Ezekiel 8 verse 2 and see how, see how Jesus himself, the son, is described. Ezekiel 8 and verse 2. Ezekiel, the 8th chapter and verse 2. It says, Then I beheld and lo, the likeness of, as the appearance of what? Fire. From the appearance of his loins, even what? Downward. Fire. And from his loins, even upward, the appearance of the brightness as the color of amber. So you realize that, that, that Jesus' appearance here in his eagle is that a fire. Amen? Is that the only description given of Jesus with fire? Let's turn to Revelation 1 and verse 14. Revelation 1 and verse 14. Revelation 1. And the 14th verse. It says, His head and his ears were like were white like wool, as as white as snow, and his eyes were as what? A flame of fire. Let's turn to Revelation 4, verse 5 to see more descriptions incorporating fire. It says, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. So you know that the Holy Spirit is also represented by who? Fire, by fire, by what? Fire. So in God's kingdom, it is a city set on fire. Now, brothers and sisters, we turn to Daniel 7 and verse 9. Going back to the book of Daniel 7 and verse 9. And I promise you again, brothers and sisters, this is going somewhere. Daniel 7 and verse 9. Daniel 7 and verse 9. It says, The world till thrones were cast down, and the ancients of the they sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame of what? And his wheels are what? As a burning fire. So even God's throne is fiery. Does it sound like heaven is a place where it is just fire all around? But God's throne is fire. God himself is fire. The sun is, is on fire. The Holy Spirit is on fire. God's throne is on fire. The, 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 there, is a, there, is a, there is a stream issuing from God that is on fire. So everything seems to be on fire and we should be on fire. Amen. Because he says you are a light. You are a candlestick. Even the angelic beings are ministering spirits of fire. If you read Hebrews 1 verse 7. And there are other beings called cherubim which are spirits of fire as well. Let's turn to Ezekiel 1 and verse 30. Ezekiel 1 and verse 30 to see these, these wonderful cherubim which are actually spirits of fire. So all the angels according to Hebrews 1 verse 7 are spirits of fire. But even the cherubim, a different class of angels are, 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 are fire. It says here, in verse 13, as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like what? Burning coals of fire. And like the appearance of lamps, it went up and down among the living creatures. And the fire was bright. And out of the fire went forth what? Lightnings. So God's creatures in heaven are fiery creatures. These four living creatures that are very close to God. Can we turn to 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11? 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11. Second Kings chapter 2 and verse 11 states. We are turning in our Bibles. It says, And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that the whole year appeared a chariot of 
Where was this chariot coming from? Heaven. And where was the chariot going? Heaven. So, so this chariot was a celestial chariot. And the Bible says that this chariot was a chariot of fire. And horses of fire. And parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into him. Can we turn to uh, 2 Kings 6 verse 17 please? 2 Kings 6 and verse 17. 2 Kings 6 and verse 17. Gehazi could not see that God was protecting him. And Elijah, Elisha prayed a prayer. And in verse 17 it says, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. Amen. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of what? Fire around about Elisha. Why is it that everything is in, in heaven represented by fire? Why fire? Because we, we don't like fire, right? If the parents in here should see their children playing around with fire, you would get weary. We don't like, we don't gravitate to fire. We more gravitate to water. But why is it that God uses fire to represent his kingdom? Let's turn to Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, and looking at verse 6. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, and verse 6. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, and verse 6. It says, Set me as a seal upon thy heart. With God's people be seal. Amen. It says, Set me as a seal upon thy heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave. Coals thereof, the coals thereof are the coals of fire, which have a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all his substance of his house for love, it would utterly be content. So what is fiery? Love. Did the Bible say that God is love? So because God is love and love is a consuming fire, our God, being love, is a consuming fire. Yes. So the manifestation of God's love is represented by this vehement flame that cannot be quenched. Amen. So the love of God is represented by fire. Amen. Brothers and sisters, are we to have the love of God? Amen. Are we to be on fire then? Yes. Are we supposed to have this, this love that cannot be quenched? As we talk about personal ministries, when we reach out to the wider public, we have to have a love that cannot be quenched. Amen. Amen. We are going to be reaching out to people who don't see things the way we see, who don't believe the way we believe. Amen. We are going to be reaching out for people who don't even believe in God. Amen. But we are to always exemplify a love that cannot be quenched. Amen. Because that is the love of God. We don't meet standards for God to love us. God loves us and then we meet the standards because of his love. Amen. God doesn't wait on us to manifest love to love us. And God is looking for a people who will love like he loves. Amen. Because he says you are the light of the world. A city that cannot be hid. You are not to be hid. But the only way you can shine is if you have that kind of love in you that cannot be quenched. If you don't have that kind of love, guess what? You are not shining really. Let's look at Deuteronomy 33 and verse 2. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 2. So we are all in agreement that we need the love of God. Amen? Yeah. But it's not an ordinary love. It's a love that cannot be quenched. And brothers and sisters, I'm the first to admit that it is not an easy love to attain to. Amen. Because that love will make people pluck your beard out and you, you, you have to hold your tongue and not respond the same way they treat you. That kind of love will cause people to run nails through your hand. And you would have to just pray for God to forgive them. That is the kind of love that cannot be quenched. And brothers and sisters, I'm the first to admit, Brother Wazari Johnson does not possess that love on it, uh, um, naturally. If somebody runs a nail through my hand and I don't resist or, or act just like them, it's because it's God working in me. If God is, is, is to leave me up to myself, I want to turn around and fight. But God says you have to have this kind of love that cannot be quenched. And brothers and sisters, we cannot attain it by ourselves. And that is why we need Jesus. Amen. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 2 
says, and he said, Lord, the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with 10,000 of saints with his right hand, sorry, from his right hand, went up fiery law for them. No, what law is this fiery law? What law is this fiery law that, that went from God's right hand? Let's turn to Exodus 31 and verse 18. Exodus 31 and verse 18 to see what this, this, this fiery law is. It says here, And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, the tables of stone written with the finger of God. So this is the Ten Commandments, amen. amen. The Ten Commandments was written in stone, amen. amen. So the fiery law is the Ten Commandments, and the Bible says it was written with the finger of God. But brothers and sisters, would we want to find out what this finger of God is? The finger of God. Is it literally saying God used his finger and, and scratched in Ten Commandments? Let's look at what the Bible calls the finger of God. Let's turn to Luke 11, verse 20. Luke chapter 11 and verse 20 to see who this finger of God is. And I purposely said it that way. Luke chapter 11 and verse 20 tells us who the finger of God is. 11 and verse 20 it says, But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt, the kingdom of God is come upon you. Now, when Jesus made this statement, when you read the entire chapter of Luke 11, they were saying that it was by the power of the devil that he was casting out devils. But he said that he was casting out devils by the Holy Ghost. And he referred to the Holy Ghost as the finger of God. So the fiery law was written by the Holy Ghost himself. He is the finger of God that etched the law in the tables of stone. And God used that mechanism for a reason. Because the Holy Ghost, you know that in the book of Isaiah there was a prophecy that says that there, there, there would come a time when God would not write his law in tables of stone anymore. But in the flesh, the pillows of our hearts. And who is the person in God head that writes the law in our hearts? It is the Spirit of God. So God was using Sinai to teach a principle far beyond what the people understood. He was actually saying, I am not planning on writing my fiery law into tables of stone, but I want that fire in the hearts of my people. Amen. I want the Holy Spirit's fire to be in the hearts of the congregation of the living God. Amen. Your heart is the pillow that God wants to write in. Amen. And you know what, brothers and sisters? I, I said something once to someone and they never understood what I was saying. I know of 10 times we have to try to understand what people are saying and what people are not saying. I said to the person, do you believe that the Ten Commandments are in heaven, written in, in, in pillars of stone? That is what the angels are from eternity. And the person said, yes. I said, I don't believe that. And I said, how oh, could you not believe it? I said, I believe the commandments existed throughout eternity in a principle, but not in tables of stone. And they said, no, the angels just have ten commandments. And I said, you want us to look at the, the ten commandments literally? There's a commandment that says, honor your mother, your mother and your father. So that your days will be long in the land. Now, can you name one angel that had a mother and father? Name one. You can even contact me after the service. And you can come with a name if you find one angel that has a mother and father. So, is it literally thou shalt honor thy mother and father? That angels had to obey? No. Because they only have a father. They don't have a mother and father. But the Ten Commandments, Jesus said, you should love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And love thy neighbor as thyself. Upon these two hang all the law and the prophets. So really the Ten Commandments is encapsulated in one principle. Love. That is what the angels obeyed. That was the law of the angels. It was not Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is because our minds became dunce. And God had to break it up into ten and break up love into ten principles. Because our minds were tough. And then because our minds were even more tough, God had to give Moses other laws and statutes to explain love to us. Because we were so far removed from love. But angels don't have ten commandments. Angels just live in love. And brothers and sisters, if we can't love each other, we are not preparing for the society of angels. Amen. Amen. 
Because angels just live to serve. Oh, yeah. Angels just live to serve. Oh, yeah. Today is personal ministries day, right? Yeah. You know, personal ministries is not about going out and giving trucks and writing down how many trucks you give and how many pants length you give away and how much things of better milk you give away. And they would feel like we are good because we are doing all these little things. No. Personal ministry is about reaching out to the society in genuine love Amen. and leaving God with the results. Because God's word of love will not come back to him while as long as it is planted in, in love, you will get back love. Amen. You might not get the love from the person that you extended the love to, but love will come back to you. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we have to change the way we approach personal ministries. Because the Jews had this habit of proselyting, you know, the Jews used to have crusades as well. Jesus said, you travel land and sea to make a proselyte of a man. But when you are done with it, he's too full the child of the devil. And I, and I, I might put myself in problems here. But you know that sometimes we travel land and sea to make a proselyte. And sometimes the way we create a bad environment, people leave God's house and become children of the devil. But then they become too full. Because they were already Satan's children. Mm. I was Satan's child. When I was outside of the commonwealth of Israel, I was not of God. That's why in Romans it says, by the spirit of adoption, we cry above Father. But so if I was adopted, I belonged to somebody else. Amen. I was just taken into a family. But if I was adopted, I was in another family. Or I come originally from another family. Yeah. But Romans 8 says that when I come into God's family, I cry with the spirit of adoption, Abba Father. So my father unfortunately was the devil. But when you bring a proselyte and, and you don't have an environment of love, and that person doesn't feel the love and is not convinced that you are of God because God is love. The Bible says, he, he who loveth not is not of God. Because God is love. So when they don't experience love and they go about, they become a child of the devil again. So they are too full of the child of the devil. We are, we are still in personal ministries today, amen? Amen. You know, one thing I would never just urge upon you, brother, brethren, just go outside and give some tracks, give some priorities, give some this and give some that, and, 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 and crusade is around the corner, let's just, let's just canvas the community, you know, let the people know that at certain seasons we just go out and, like the hypocrites, just remember them around certain seasons. Pardon me for that strong word, but it is rather hypocritical to not care for anybody. For, 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 for several year, days in the year and then when a certain season comes in and we want to catch them then all of a sudden oh brother can I give you a book oh brother let me share something with you about Jesus we should always love people Amen. should always love people Amen. love is not based on conditions Amen. and I would not use the word true love because there is only love yes. anything that is not love is selfishness Amen. And it is rather selfish to ignore people for the, for the grand majority of a year and then when it is around a certain season, yes. we go with books and literature and we do good deeds. You know, recently I, I heard somebody say we have a day of kindness and, 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 I, and I was rather troubled by it. Brothers and sisters, I know my mind goes into some troublesome directions. But a day of kindness? No, we leave those things to hypocrites. Christians don't have a day of kindness. <laughs> Every day is a day of kindness for the Christian. Amen. 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 It's a hard word, right? Well, who can you have a day of kindness? Aren't you called to be kind every single day as a Christian? Yes. No, the world can't have a day of kindness. I don't have a problem with the world having a day of kindness because they don't know better. But Romans, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says that agape love, charity, is kind Amen. and peaceable. Amen. Long suffering. So, so, so for the Christian who is living in love, there's no day of kindness. And when we start legislating kindness and having days of kindness, it is hypocrisy, brothers and sisters. Amen. It's hypocrisy. And that is why sometimes we, we, we do these things and only remember people at certain seasons because we have been accustomed to being hypocrites. Yes. Yes. I guess that is a hard word. But it is the truth. Amen. Amen. You know, even yesterday I, I saw something on Facebook where somebody, another thing that I found so offensive. Somebody started this movement to petition, pray. 
you, you, you know what after after the cockpit country situation and many petitions were signed and people said protect the cockpit country I can understand that my sister said something in her affidavit render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar render unto God the things that are God now is there a, a ministry that deals with planning and environment the government has a ministry that deals with that, right? Housing, environment, and planning. So environment, that including the country, country, falls under the auspices of the government, which represents Caesar. So you can render to Caesar. You, you can say, I will sign a petition to protect something that has to do with the environment because there's a ministry that deals with the environmental issues. Is there a ministry of prayer? No. No. Should the government tell you when to pray? No. Should the government tell you how to pray? No. And should the government tell you how to pray and who to pray to? No. So how can you pitch and pray through the government? How can you render to God through Caesar? And these are Christians. These are Christians asking for, for the government to petition the people to have a day of prayer. And brothers and sisters, that is why it is so important for us to step up personal ministries. Because you see that petition, it is just a signal that the churches are going in a direction that is dangerous. Because they are telling the government to legislate worship. They are inviting the government to legislate worship. How can you petition people to pray? That's so ridiculous. And we have come to an age where we are not... Be we, we are to petition prayer and not just pray because we love our Father. Brothers and sisters, you understand how perverse that is? So Luke 11, Luke 11 shows that the Holy Spirit is the, the finger of God and, 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 that, and that the Holy Spirit is the one that is going to write the laws in our hearts. Now brothers and sisters, it says that we should be lit. It says that we are to shine. And I'm bringing my sermon down to a close. It says we are to shine. I want us to go back to Matthew chapter 5. And let us look at something for a moment, brothers and sisters. If we are supposed to be candid, before a candle can shine, what, what, what has to happen? It has to be lit. Amen? Amen? So if we are candles and we are to be lit, how are we lit? Because we are still on personal ministries. Because the shining is your witness. And, and if we are candles and we are to shine, we have to be lit. Now normally, in our context, we use a match to light a candle. But back in those days, it was flint stones and so on. And then, Flint stones were very difficult to, 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 to use to generate light. So once you got something lit, another candle, you would use one candle to light other candles. Amen? Let's turn to Psalm 119, 105 to see what is the original candle that we need. Or an original lamp that we need to be lit. Psalms 119, 105 tells us what we need to be lit. It says what? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So God's word is what lights us. And do you know that the Holy Spirit is he who inspired the word of God? So the Holy Spirit uses the word of God as a lighting agent to light us. That is why brothers and sisters, from I've been standing here before you, I've been using the Bible. Brothers and sisters, we have come to a time where you will hear a sermon and two texts are used. And then go, we go off into story time and, and these things. But brothers and sisters, we have to go back to the Bible. Amen. You cannot be properly lit without the Bible. Amen. And brothers and sisters, let's turn to Psalm, the 18th division of the Psalm. Psalm 18 and verse 28 to see that the Bible actually and, um, and reinforces what I'm saying. Psalm 18, Psalm 18 and verse 28. Verse 28, Psalm 19, 18, sorry, Psalm 18 and verse 28, it says, For thou will 
light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. You know that the Bible said to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Amen. And you know that the law represents the five, right, the books of Moses, all the books of Moses, including Job. Include, well, the law is really the five main books of Moses. But, but Job was inspired by, by, by God as well. And Job was written by Moses. But all the other writings of the prophets are the testimonies. So the law and the testimony is another way of saying the word of God. The Bible says if they don't speak according to the word of God, it's because there's no light in them. No, 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 no. The Bible says that God will enlighten our darkness. So it is his word that he uses. But how does God use the word to enlighten us? Let's turn to, 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 to Proverbs 20, verse 27. Proverbs 20 and verse 27. Proverbs 20 and verse 27 tells us how God lights our minds. Proverbs 20 and verse 27. Proverbs 20 says, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts. So, 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 so it says that, that the spirit of man, and in the original Hebrew it's really saying the mind of man is the candle of the Lord. So God lights your candle by igniting your mind with the word of God. So if we are not studying the word of God, brothers and sisters, we will not shine. We will not shine. And you know that the Bible uses several examples to show this. You know, Moses, actually, aside from Jesus, fasted for the days and for the night. You know that when the law was being given to Moses, he was in the, 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 the heights of the mountains communing with God and he didn't, went up, he didn't go up with a basket of food. He was there without food and water for 40 days and 40 nights, but he was being fed by the word of God. And the Bible said when Moses was there communing with God for 40 days and 40 nights, when he came down after his, his being was filled with the word of God, the people couldn't even look at him. The people said, Moses, hide yourself under a veil. We can't be even looking at you. The word of God caused Moses to physically shine. Brothers and sisters, in Acts chapter 6, going into Acts chapter 7, there was a young man full of the Holy Ghost called Stephen. One of the first deacons. And Stephen was there disputing about Christ with some of the top scholars in the, in the church back then. And when they saw that they couldn't counter what Stephen was saying, they, they, they went for some bigger scholars. And then Stephen took them from Moses and all the prophets, went through the word of God. And showed them that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom they crucified, is truly the Messiah. Amen. And the Bible said that when these men who were enemies of Stephen looked upon his face, they said that they saw his face shine as it were an angel. The word of God was in Stephen, but the word of God came out of Stephen. You know that Isaiah, the 60th chapter says that this last generation, it says, Arise, shine, for the light is come. And the glory of the God, the Lord of heaven, will be here with her. It says that in the last days, gross darkness will cover the earth and, and gross darkness the people. But God's command for us is to, uh, for us to shine. Yes. But we cannot shine without the word of God. Yes. We have to be like Moses, communing with God for several days so that the light will come out of us. We have to be like Stephen because the Holy Spirit could use Stephen to do that if he was unfamiliar with scriptures. Amen. You know, you have a whole generation coming up that are unfamiliar with scripture. Brothers and sisters, we need to go back to being people of the word. Amen. And the Bible says the spirit of man. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Let's turn to Matthew 15. And see why that this is such a grievous thing to God. Matthew the 15 chapter. You know that if you, if you have healthy eyes. You know, if God gave you healthy eyes at birth and you are always in darkness, like, like you, you, you live 15 years in darkness, you know, after a while your good eyes will go bad and you will go blind. If you are always in darkness, even if you had healthy eyes at birth, if you are always in darkness, you know, eventually you will go blind. So darkness is not a good thing, brothers and sisters. And, 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 what, and what does the Bible say about, 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 about being blind? Let's turn to Matthew 15 and looking at verse 14, it says, Matthew 15 and verse 14 says, Oh my. So God here says, Jesus here says to them, leave them alone. Because they be what? 
blind leaders of the of the blind blind leaders of the blind and, 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 and God said something that because they are blind leaders of the blind they are going to fall into a ditch let's turn to Proverbs 23 and verse 27 Proverbs 23 and verse 27 it says for a whore is a deep and a strange woman is a narrow pit who in Revelation is the whore who, 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 who in Revelation is the word? The Roman church. I should hear if Seventh-day Adventists giving me a resounding answer. Because this is a part of our message why we were created. This is a part of the third angels, the three angels' messages, especially the third. So Seventh-day Adventists should know this like the back of their hand. So I'm not going to ask the question again. Who is the word? The Roman church. And brothers and sisters, it said if you are blind and you have blind guides leading the blind, you eventually are going to fall into the ditch. Yeah. You know that anyone who is not being lit by God and remaining in darkness is going to fall into the war of Rome. Yes. 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 You, might know the, you might know that the seventh day Sabbath is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Yes. But when you look at the issue of the mark of the beast, it says that some will get it in the forehead. But some will get it in the right hand. So the right hand represents your works. You are not spiritually convicted that it is the true day of worship. But you will go along with it. Because you were blind. And you were a blind person being led by other blind people. And the Bible says if you allow yourself to be blind and you are led by blind people, you will fall into the ditch. Even though you are a Seventh-day Adventist. So brothers and sisters, we cannot afford to be blind. Amen. Cannot afford to be blind. Amen. And, and, and look at this last rebuke right here from the book of Revelation. You know, in, 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 in the prayer session this morning, sister, sister, sister Betty did not know what she was praying about. She was just praying and the Spirit of the Lord was guiding her. But she was talking several things about the sermon this morning. And one thing before I get up in the pulpit and speak, I always ask God. I might have a plan, but God, you have to confirm that is what I'm supposed to see. Because this, this place is a serious place, brothers and sisters. You don't come up here and trifle. You don't come up here and play the fool and have a pantomime. When you come here, you must be so afraid of what comes out of your mouth and say, God, please, write my tongue. Because we have come to a day and age where many people just want to be an entertainer. And they come and want to entertain, but I'm not here for your entertainment, brothers and sisters. Amen. Did you see the hurricanes and the earthquakes and all these calamities Amen. He, he in one week? Amen. The signs are foretelling that Jesus is eating at the door. So I can't come here and, and have a pantomime and, and run jokes with you. Because I don't know if you can go there in the community and die. God forbid that it happens, but, but, but under this song, anything can happen. And it is a travesty for somebody to come here and try to with your soul. Amen. I say that without apology. The time is too serious. Amen. It's too serious, brothers and sisters. Amen. You can't just come in this pulpit and, and go on with verbal gymnastics. When a people is unprepared to meet God. Because this what I'm about to read is not my opinion. These are not my words. This is the word of the faithful and true witness. And the Bible says a true witness will not lie. And a faithful witness saves souls. So the purpose of the true and faithful witness is that he wants not to lie to you. He wants to tell you what your true condition is. But the purpose is not to injure God's church. Because you have some that say they are, they are, they are in the present truth. And they will call themselves present truthers. But their chief purpose is to injure the church. Amen. I'm not here to injure you. I'm here to tell you the truth as it is in Jesus. Amen. And the purpose of me sharing the truth is because I want you to be sealed. Yes. Because some of us like judging each other. Yeah. And tearing down each other and speaking things behind each other's backs. But when you read Revelation chapter 7, there's a tribe missing. There's a son of Joseph that is not listed in Revelation chapter 7. And his name is Dan. And when you read Genesis 49, it explains why Dan's name is not there. The Bible says Dan is an Adam. And an Adam is a snake. Dan is an Adam and he's a serpent by the way. 
and he bites the horse's heel and the heel of the horse is behind him it's, it, it's at his back and he caused the rider to fall backwards so Dan's purpose in, in Israel was not to uplift it was to judge and destroy yes. and he was a backbiter Dan would never go in front of your face and tell you what problems he had with you Dan would leave and go into secret councils and say Yo, you, you know I don't like this one and that one and you should like that one and that one too Dan would never talk to somebody's face. And Psalms chapter 15 says that backbiters will not dwell in the heavens. Backbiters will be cut off from God's sanctuary in heaven. So when we think adultery and, and murder and stealing and all those other bad sins are the only bad ones. When you look at the, the tribes that were saved, some of these men were guilty of these sins. But there was a backbiter that was, that was there. But he didn't seem so dangerous, but God cut him off. There is no tribe of Dan in Revelation chapter 7. And it shows God this deal for backbiting. And do you know that the prophet of the Lord that I believe to be an inspired woman, her name is Sister White, she said that nine-tenths of all the problems in the church stem from backbiting, 90%. Can you imagine that? 90%. So 10% of the problems can be easily solved if you, if you, if you, if you, if you curve the tongue. Amen. Amen. And you know, James said it is an unruly evil. Yes. It says, all manner of beasts that man can tame. But the top, no man can tame. Yeah. It is an unruly evil. It says, set on the fire of hell. Can you imagine? You can tame a python snake. You can probably tame a crocodile, but if you can't tame your tongue, have mercy. My word. Let's turn to, 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 to Revelation chapter 3 in closing. My time is far spent. Amen? I thought I would hear you, amen. <laughs> you don't believe my time is far spent? <laughs> Revelation 3 and verse 17. And let us just go to our silent prayer in our minds of the little one. You know, because she's, she's being disturbed. You don't see her as a negative person. She's, she's just young and being disturbed. So just utter a silent prayer on your mind. For the little one. Revelation 3 and verse 17. It says, Because thou sayest I am a rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. So is, 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 is Laodicea in danger of falling into the ditch? Because she's blind. But thank God, if she's led by a guy that can see, and that is the Savior himself. We can't just look to man, brothers and sisters. We have to look to the guy that can see. But if Laodicea continues to look to themselves, because God says that all of Laodicea is blind. So if you are just looking to your fellow Laodicea and for leadership and saying, oh, be my guy, you are in trouble because God says you are blind. And he didn't say so many yeah. years are blind. He says you are all blind. Yeah. So for you to avoid falling into the dish, you have to stop looking to man and looking to God because he yeah. can see. Amen. Yeah. And he has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Yeah. So he, seven eyes means he can see perfectly. Yeah. So he can guide perfectly. Yeah. God is our guide. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Uh, we look too much to man after time, but the Bible says all in the this are blind. So if you trust man in Laodicea, you will fall into the ditch. But if you trust the God, the Lamb with the seven eyes, you will be guided perfectly. Amen. And the Bible says that Laodicea is wretched and miserable and poor and blind. But verse 18 says, I counsel you. By of me, go and try it in fire. Get some character that is tried by the fire, which is the spirit of God. Your goal has to be tried in the fire. And, and, and brothers and sisters, you have to look at what it says here. Laodicea, it says, in verse 14, it says, I'm to the angel of the church of Laodiceans, right? So this message went to the angel of the church of the Laodicea. And God is, 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 is saying to this angel that, that, that the people should repent. Do you think it's an angel in the name of the No. No, Angelos is messenger. Amen. Messenger. 
to the messenger of the church of the Laodiceans right. To the messenger of the church of the Laodiceans right. And the messenger are those who receive of God a particular message for each church. Amen. And brothers and sisters, you know the ones God is rebuking here in the Laodicea are not apostates. You know when we see apostates in makeup and jewelry and all those things, we believe this is what they are talking about. Remember, you know, the Bible says in Revelation 1 that, that, that Jesus was walking among seven candlesticks. And the candlesticks were all lit. So, so if they were all lit, they all had the spirit of God. But they needed extra oil. Amen. They needed extra oil. They needed more of the spirit. You know when you read the book, Christ subject lesson, Sister White says that the five foolish virgins were not hypocrites. She said that the five foolish virgins loved the truth. But their character was lacking. Amen. They love great messages. They love the present truth. They love correct doctrines. But the character transformation from the Spirit of God was lacking. They never loved. In closing, let us turn to Matthew, the 25th chapter. Because recently I was studying this chapter and I realized something that I never realized before. Do you know that all of Matthew 25 is talking about the same thing? Amen. You know, I, I used to separate the parables. But the parables are dealing with every, all of them are saying the same thing. One is just amplifying the other. Because it starts out in Matthew 25 with a, a, a bridegroom, a, 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 bride, a, a bridal party scene. With ten virgins and five were wise and five were foolish. And it gives the illustration that the, the, the wise had extra oil. But the foolish never had extra eye. The foolish went out to, to, to get some and then they didn't get it. And then when they came back, they realized that the door was closed and they couldn't get it. They couldn't get the oil at the time. Because the oil was gone. The, the harvest was far spent. And many of them could only say we are not seeing. Then the second portion of the parable deals with the unwise and unuseful servant. All servants were there and they got portions of talents from the master. And, 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 and one of them decided that, you know, my master is a hard man. And he reap it where he sows none. So I'm just going to bury my talent. That at least he get back the one that he gave me. But, but, but the master was so cut up about it because he said, you know, this man is a foolish person. Because look at the rest of them. They went and gave their resources to the exchangers and came back with extra. Brothers and sisters, you know that that unfruitful and unwise servant represents those in the church who have been giving gifts and talents and don't use it. Hey. And you know that to get the extra oil for your lamp, you must be using your spiritual gift. You know everybody looking at me now. Do you know that everybody in this room has a spiritual gift? Amen. Amen. If you don't have a spiritual gift, you are not a part of the body of Christ. Amen. You might have a name in the church book. But if you don't have a spiritual gift, you are not a part of God's body. Go and read 1 Corinthians 12. Amen. Every member of the church has a spiritual gift. Amen. And every member of the church has a talent invested in them by God. So the work of evangelism, the work of soul saving is not reserved to the pastors and the elders board and the deacons only. You are a worker in the cause of God. Amen. You are a worker in the cause of God. And if you are not using your spiritual gift, you will be lost. Amen. You will be without oil. Amen. You will be found wanting. Now brothers and sisters, we are here in the amens, but what is your spiritual gift? Well, God said it now. Because you know that I have asked this question in several churches. And what I realize, brothers and sisters, is that most of us don't even know what our spiritual gift is. And isn't that problematic, brothers and sisters? Because how can you shine as you ought to shine when you don't even know why you are here? Some of us don't even know if we have the gift of healing. Some of us don't even know if we have the gift of the, the discerning spirits. Some of us don't even know if we have the gift of being a teacher. 
I have the gift of knowledge. I have the gift of wisdom. I will have the correct gift of tongues. Because do you know that in some cases God will give you other languages to speak? Yeah. I was recently in Tanzania, uh, in Africa, and I couldn't speak Swahili, even though my name comes from the language. And after one week of going to church, I found church to be so disconnected because I didn't know the language. But you know, after a while, I found myself understanding certain things. Even though I, I never even got the language at the point. Sometimes when they said something, it started to become clearer and clearer to me. And I believe God was assisting me by understanding tongues. After being there a while, I started to understand their tongue. And I believe God literally was helping me. And God will do that in certain cases. Now I'm not talking about talking something which is no language at all and rolling on the ground. I'm talking about understanding various languages. Amen. Amen. But some of us don't even know if God wants us to manifest this gift. We don't even know where we fit into the body. Yeah. And do you know that the last parable deals with a certain thing that many of us as Christians are guilty of? The last parable is the same as the first. The first parable is to help us to understand the last. The first parable says that they lacked oil. They lacked any true character. They never used their talents in service based on the second parable. And you know what the third parable is about? God separating sheep from goat. You know, this interesting thing with sheep is that sheep have a particular way of eating. You won't find sheep eating newspaper. They have a particular diet. And what God's people eat a particular way. Spiritually and physically. The sheep feed on the word of God. And we know God gave us the right arm of the third ages messages, which is our health message. And brothers and sisters, you know, goats do as they please. A goat is a rebellious creature. My father raised his goats. He's a farmer. And the worst thing he could ask me to do is tie out a goat. A goat will pull you all over the place. A goat will fight you. A goat will sometimes butt you in the hand. A goat will even butt you on the side of the leg. A goat is rebellious. It's a perfect imagery for Satan. A goat is rebellious. And Jesus says he will come and separate the sheep from the goat. And the sheep he will put on his right hand. But the goat he will put on the left. And when the goat end up on, on, the, on, the, on the left hand, the goat start asking Jesus some question. The goat, the goat, the goat start saying, why am I here? Because Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name cast out devils. And in thy, and in thy name don't, did many wonders and miracles. And then Jesus is going to say to, to the goats, I Never knew you. Depart from me. He that do iniquity. What is iniquity, brothers and sisters? Sin. And sin is what? The transgression of the law. But how can these people be prophesied about law breaking? Is it that they thought that they understood the law of God, but they were still breaking the law? Thought that they were Sabbath keeping, but they were still breaking the law? Because while they were observing the letter, they did not have the spirit, which is love. And the, the, the sheep have the spirit. The sheep have the spirit. Because when, when Jesus turns to the sheep, he says, Come, blessed of my Father, come into the kingdom, prepared for thee from the foundations of the earth. Because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you gave me clothes. When I was bound and in prison, you visited me. And then the sheep started to say, Well, Lord, when, when, when we did, when, when we did, when, when we did, when did we see you naked and clothe you? When we did, did we see you hungry and feed you? When, when, we, when we did, when did we see you in prison and visit you? When? And Jesus said, understand this. When you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Every loving good act that you did for the least. You did it for me. Man. Come. Come. Because you are keeping the law. You love your neighbor as yourself. You are worthy to live in the society of the agent. This is personal ministries, brothers and sisters. 
You realize that the sheep didn't even have some form of note in their, in their hand to say, I gave seven pants length, so I know you're talking about me. Or oh, I, 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 I gave Paxi a case of Betamil. So it must be me. They didn't even remember the good deeds. They just did it because it was necessary, brothers and sisters. They just did it because it's necessary. They saw people in need. They saw people in prison. They saw people naked. They saw people hungry. And that is personal ministries. You can't legislate love. You can't organize love. And one thing I love about my church is that it is organized. But you cannot organize love. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we have to allow love to flow naturally out of us. That's right. Isaiah 58 talks about the repairers of the bridge. But if you read the first verses, it says, You come to me fasting as, as, one, as a set of people who love righteousness. But God says, Is this the fast that I have required? That, that you, you push your head out as a bulrush? Or is this the fast that I require? That you deal your bread to the hungry? That you clothe the naked? And that you bring those who are cast out into your house? And that you hide not yourself from your own flesh? You are flesh just like the man out there, the sinner. Don't hide yourself and think you are better than him. Don't hide yourself from your own flesh. Brothers and sisters, you have a duty to the community and to every place that you come in contact with. Don't hide yourself from your own flesh. Don't say to yourself that you are children of Abraham. I am a seventh day Adventist because God is able to raise up off the stones, children of Abraham. Because you are listening to a stone right now. I never knew God when I was a child. I never, I never walked in the ways of the Lord. But God met me and God changed my heart. And God said, I will put words into your mouth to share with my people. Brothers and sisters, personal ministries has to change. We can't continue being hypocrites. We are not rich and increased with goods. We are in need of everything. And the thing that we are most in need of is Jesus. Amen. Amen. I know, brothers and sisters, any fool can smoke a cigarette, any fool can go to a dance hall, any fool can listen to vibes cartel, any fool can, can do anything you want to do. But you know, Christianity requires real upright people. Amen. Real strong people. Christianity is not for cowards, you know. You know that is a coward that fit in with the crowd. Amen. Amen. You know everything the world does, we try to fit in. Yes. I mean, we try to, we try to. I remember the first week after being baptized, I was a coward. I never wanted anybody to see me going up the road in a Bible, and I was looking for my friends and trying to hide the Bible. And then I came yes. to my sins and I said, "Look what God did for you. Why are you hiding that book?" Let them see who you are now. Amen. And I never hid my Bible again. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to give a call and I want to start with the young people. Now God is looking for an army of youth. Amen. That will be right the train. Amen. I never just say God wants an army of youth. They have to be right the train. Amen. They have to know the word of God. And they have to have resolve to fight in this war. You can't, you can't, are you know one thing with an army? An army wears a particular uniform. Amen. The army, the army that you 